welcome to Comics Crash Course. For the last two episodes, we've discussed the proliferation of genres in the comics of the Golden Age, from superheroes to romance. In this episode, I'm going to discuss two more genres, horror and crime. I'll also discuss the rise of EC Comics, because even though other companies published horror and crime comics, they were hugely popular in the last days of the Golden Age, EC became inextricably linked with these genres. Now, I mentioned detective and crime comics briefly last week, and it's true that detective and mystery comics had been popular since the beginning of the Golden Age. What sets late Golden Age crime comics apart from early Golden Age detective and mystery comics is the emphasis on the crime and the criminal over the detective. Less... More... Say my name. Of course, with a shift on the focus toward antagonists and antiheroes, the subject matter gets a bit darker, and the stories tended to be more violent. Crime comics would still usually end with the criminal getting caught, and so artists would argue that they were still effectively morality tales. They showed how terrible life was for criminals, and that justice would always prevail. But critics would argue that the emphasis was still on the lurid details, and less on the actual justice. And, well, they weren't wrong. Take a look, for example, at how the title of Crime Does Not Pay, a very popular crime book, changes over time. Throughout the early 1940s, it looked like this. Crime does not pay. In the early 1950s, as criticism of crime comics increased, does not pay increases, even though crime is still bigger. After the comics code gets adopted, which we'll talk about in a couple episodes, does not pay literally becomes bigger than crime, as publishers give in to sensorial and parental demands. You can also watch the increased presence of police on the cover and the decreased presence of violent imagery. But crime comics weren't really meant for kids. Remember, comic books exploded in the scenes in the early 1930s. Soldiers were reading them in the trenches of World War II, and by the late 1940s, older teens and adults had grown up on comics. And of course, some of them wanted to keep reading comics and might not have wanted the kind of material that was in a lot of superhero books or funny animal books. They might have wanted something that was a bit more mature, and even dark in its themes. However, comic books were still seen primarily as a medium for children, and they were still sold in general settings. You would find Crime Does Not Pay right next to Disney comics on the spin rack at a local grocery store or the shelf of a newsstand. When horror comics hit the scene, parental concern shot to 11. While the content of crime comics and glorification of criminals was a major concern, well, horror comics was its controversy on its sleeve cover. Horror's stock and trade is shocking imagery, and horror comic publishers, well, they knew controversy sold books. The crazier the cover, the more likely it would be that someone would pick it up. And you know what else sells? Sex. So horror and crime comics often went for broke by making scantily clad women the victims of crimes or the monsters, which of course didn't make parents any happier. When people talk about crime in horror comics, you'll hear one name come up over and over again. EC Comics. And there's a good reason for it. Not only did they make some of the highest quality crime in horror comics, which meant they made some of the most shocking of the genre, but it also meant that they produced some of the best written, the most thoughtful, and the best drawn comics in those genres. On top of that, when the parental concern that I've been discussing turns into a full-blown moral panic, EC Comics became the focal point of the investigation for the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, an investigation that leads to the adoption of the Comics Code. This is a story we'll be talking about for the next few weeks, and EC is right at the center of it. Interestingly, the story of EC Comics begins with a familiar name, Maxwell Gaines, the same man who was influential in publishing Famous Funnies, the first comic book. In 1944, he sold his company American Comics to DC Comics, uh, the company publishing Superman, and founded EC, which then stood for Educational Comics. His headlining title was Picture Stories from the Bible, but he also published Picture Stories from Science, Picture Stories from World History. You get the gist. In 1947, Max died in a boating accident, and his son William, generally called Bill, took over the company. Bill Gaines saw that educational comics weren't particularly profitable and began to introduce new titles that followed popular trends, like my personal favorite, Moon Girl, a sci-fi-tinged Wonder Woman ripoff, The Happy Hands, a family humor book, Saddle Justice, a western, you get the gist. And these did all right. In the meantime, Gaines had hired Al Feldstein and Harvey Kurtzman, talented artists in their own rights, but they were also great story editors. 
they conceived of the idea of a new trend, a series of books inspired on newer genres that inspire their artists. And particularly, these featured horror, crime, and science fiction. By 1949, EC had a huge pool of highly talented artists, and under Feldstein and Kurtzman's direction, the new trend proved a huge success with fans. EC's new trend is most closely associated with the following titles. Vault of Horror and Crypt of Terror, which later became Tales from the Crypt, which launched in April 1950. Weird Science and Weird Fantasy, which were both sci-fi style books, launched in May. Haunt of Fear, which debuted in June. Crime Suspense Stories, which appeared in October and Two-Fisted Tales, which debuted in November. The following year, EC added Frontline Combat to the line, and in 1952, they added Shock Suspense Stories, a crime and thriller book, and their most famous comic book, which would become a magazine and later even a TV show, Mad. In the Golden Age, many publishers ignored their creators, sometimes not even listing their names in the publishing materials. EC, on the other hand, celebrated their artists, and they had good reason each of the artists I'm going to mention deserves their own episodes, but just to highlight some of the talent working at EC at its height, regular contributors included Johnny Craig, best known for his work on horror titles, Jack Davis, who created The Crypt Keeper and was one of the founding cartoonists at MAD, Graham Engels, whose painterly style brought a special sense of fear to horror books, Al Williamson, whose classical illustrator style and precise ink work made him a favorite on science fiction books, Wally Wood, a hugely talented artist who brought his multifaceted skill to almost all of EC's books, but is particularly loved for his sci-fi titles. Harvey Kurtzman, who was primarily an editor in this period, but would later return to his work as an artist on Mad. He's best known for his zany comic style, but would also draw several very moving war stories in Frontline Combat and Two-Fisted Tales. I'm not even mentioning other hugely talented artists who worked with EC during this period, like Bernard Krigstein, Will Elder, John Severin, Jack Common, Joe Orlando, Frank Frazetta, and Basil Wolverton. I would like to call special attention to Marie Severin, who began as an office assistant for EC in 1949, but soon became indispensable to the company. She's known mostly as a colorist during this period, for the entire company, but she did a little bit of everything, including pencils and inks, touch-ups on many of the books, and a lot of lettering. In addition to the group of hugely talented artists, EC deliberately courted an intelligent adult readership and celebrated its fans. It also created what we might call a brand identity these days, and it shared it across all of the titles. When you picked up an EC book, you could expect a similar sense of humor, usually a pretty dark humor, and stories that had some sort of twist ending, often with a kind of irony or poetic justice. EC was also a fascinatingly political company. Stories across genres often made explicitly anti-racist and anti-fascist statements, criticized McCarthy-esque politics, and called out police brutality. The company's gender politics weren't always as progressive, and they're far from perfect as a company. But there's some really interesting stuff going on in these books, especially when you consider the era. Jim Crow laws were still rampant across the United States, Cold War was raging, and McCarthy was only just beginning to gain his power in the Senate. Now, while EC might have been progressive in some ways, they also knew how to play the market game. And the controversy sold very well. EC's covers played right into the hands of concerned parents. And kind of understandably, there's some shocking stuff here. And the moral panic was about to reach a fever pitch. But we'll talk about that next time. See you then.